Jesus is with us. The plan of God is moving forward. I'm happy. You're happy. By faith, you're happy. Hallelujah. Is it a bit hot in here? It's my wife's fault. She controls the furnace. But we will drop the temperature a little bit because it feels like we're at the gates of hell. Uh, it just feels like fire and brimstone. So we, do, we want you to feel the coolness of heaven and the breeze of the Holy Ghost. So we're going to turn some fans on because I don't want to feel like I'm in Africa sweating again. So uh, Jennifer, please don't. Uh, yes. Okay. Hallelujah. Praise God. You did a real good job today, honey. That was your first time. I'm proud of you. And uh, it's, a, it's a skill and, and you did excellent. There's, there's, we're going to grow and it's going to be wonderful. So amen. Can I just encourage you on something? If you don't participate in worship, listen to me. When you, there's an anointing on the minister, on the team to help the Lord said to me some time ago, worship clears atmospheres, okay? And the anointing on the team will go, and in the realm of the spirit, people come in with sadness, they come in with depression, they come in with devils, sinners come in, different things happen, and it can affect the atmosphere of a room. I'm very sensitive to that atmosphere, and the anointing on that team can really what it does is it, it clears that atmosphere so that the word has free course to go forward. That's ultimately the purpose of worship is to worship him. But at the same time, it's, it's clearing so that there's a free atmosphere for the word. Now, listen to me. If that were, if there's an anointing on that team to do that, but the people listen to me, cause God taught me something about this recently. If the people don't participate with that team, it's not just the anointing on the team. It is the corporate anointing, which is the people. All of you have an anointing. As you worship, your anointing comes out of your spirit and it starts to affect that atmosphere. If you won't participate, even though they have an anointing and they are, they are clearing that atmosphere, but if you don't participate, it limits how much of it is cleared and there can be an oppressive feeling in the room even after worship. Now, when I got up this morning after this thing, when I stood up there, I felt that oppression in the atmosphere. And so I said to the Holy Ghost, what's going on here? Because I said, I felt, now listen, listen carefully. I'm teaching you something. This is things that pertain to the spirit. I said, I felt the anointing when she was singing and when they were singing. And now it's a different, a little bit of a different flow to our previous team and everything, but that's okay because we're, we're getting into, we're just, we're, we're progressing, we're moving. But I still felt, I felt the presence of God. I felt the anointing. So I said, Lord, the anointing was there, but so why am I feeling this oppression? Because I know it's not that oppression that is mainly demonic where I have to speak to it. It's not, it wasn't that kind. There's different kinds of oppression. I've had enough experience to know the difference. This is an oppression of an atmosphere because of the stuff people bring into the building with them. And I felt, did you sense it? I felt that oppression and I said, but Lord, I felt the anointing on the team. So why is that not clearing it out? And I heard the Holy Ghost speak to me just as loud as, as, as I'm speaking to you while I was, that's why I kept going a little bit because he was talking to me. And he said to me, he said, because the people are gawking at your wife. Yes. Now, God will talk that way. He don't talk in the old English. Yeah. Well, my people, have, he just talks. He said, the people are gawking at your wife. What is, what is he saying? They're more interested in trying to assess mentally what is happening and do I like this? And is this going to work? Is she nervous that they're not engaged when you're not engaged of the spirit because you're mental in what's happening in that worship time, that anointing in you, that corporate anointing is not lifting. And then your part to clear that, to make this place filled with the presence of God for the word to go forth. You didn't know your part. They're doing their part, but it's not just their part. It's your part as well. Do you understand? Yes. He said, that's why you feel this because they have not engaged the same way because this is new for them and they are in an observing role more than a participating role. Now, many people participated this morning, but many people did not the same way. Are you listening to me? So you have a part. They have a part. Don't just look at them to fix everything. You've got to do your part. They've got to lead you in their part together. That presence will come. That atmosphere is clear. Oppression is gone. Whatever you came in with will lift off and then have free course for the word to go. Because the word, listen, the presence of God never changes you. It refreshes you. It helps you. But only the word will wash and change your mind the way you think. That's what transforms you is by the word renewing your mind. The presence refreshes you. We'll have times of refreshing 
refreshing from the presence of the Lord, but it doesn't, it doesn't change your thinking. That's why the word has to be given. That's why it says that the word have free course. Notice it didn't say let worship have free course. Let the word have free course because the word is the only thing that changes people. The word is the only thing that gets people born again. The word is the only thing that gives you faith. And without faith, you can't even please him. You can't get anything. No. Praise God. No. So uh, it, it wasn't anything to do with you. Your team were laboring and you're doing a good job. But the people are not engaged as much because of the newness. I understand that. I'm not mad, but I'm just saying, get over it. And, and, and when you come back next time, just forget. Just, okay, we're changed. Just enter in. We shouldn't have to tell you to lift your hands. Lift your hands. And you don't have to lift them the whole time. Put them down if you want. But stand up, engage with God. And just have a flow out of your heart. Worship him. You do your part. They'll do their part. And the word will do its part. Now, I said, what do I do? Do I rebuke it? He said, no, you don't need to rebuke it because it's flesh. It's not devils. I can't rebuke flesh. I said, what do I do? I'm asking him in my mind. Now I know where it's come from because you're gawking instead of participating. Yeah. Not, not all, some. And he said, engage them, have them engage. That's why I kept going, lift up, come on, say. And I, as you started doing that, I felt that thing lift. Why? Because your anointing clears that out, brings the presence of God in. But you gotta do that from song one, not just when I stand up, praise God. Hallelujah. We're all going to, we're going to accept this transition. We're not going to fight against it. We're not going to get in our mind about it. We're not going to compare now we're at your dinner table. Now let's have the comparison family. Okay. Let's put one and the other. And okay, let's we like that. We didn't like that. We didn't like that. So who's going to win? Okay. Well, we have a winner here. That's not what we do. We're grateful for the past season. We're moving on and we're grateful for the present season and we're just going to get behind it. Can you all receive that instruction? Because I, I need to tell you that because you've got to understand you have a very important part to play in the service. You are not an observer. You are a participator. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, let's hit, let's hit the road. Uh, not to leave the building, but to open our Bibles. Some of you got really excited there for a second. I feel so loved. Anyway, <laughs> whatever, whatever, just let it go. <laughs> um, we're going to get to the scripture now in a second, but just as a brief recap, because it's been two weeks, I read some parts. I'm not going to read them again, but I read some parts of Dad Hagen's book, Plans, Purposes, and Pursuits. The title of this message here today, please, is Do You Know His Plans and Purposes and Are You Pursuing Them? Because the Lord said, read some of that book, and I want you to preach along those lines. And just as a very quick overview, uh, every year, Dad Hagen would lay everything out before the Lord and take many weeks to just wait on him and pray and say, Lord, do I change? Do I tweak? Do I remove? Do I add? And he said, many ministers do not do that. They assume that what happened last year is what God wants to do this year. And here's the problem. When you do that, you get make mistakes because now you get out of the perfect will and then back into that permissive will. Permissive will means he allows you to do something, but he's not really 100% in it. And many, listen, I would venture to say the majority of Christians live in the permissive will of God. That's why they don't get healed as easy. That's why they don't get blessed as easy. There's very few that are actually wait long enough and have enough bold faith that when God does say to do it in the right timing, that they step into that. When they do, there's, there, everything seems to work. Like Dad Hagen said, we don't believe in magic, but he said it works like magic and it just falls into place. But you've got to be in the perfect will and timing of God for that to happen. A lot of people don't, especially pastors that are leaders that need to have that. They just assume because they're busy, they're rushed. And that's how mistakes are made. And then they think the things aren't working right for them because the message is wrong. It's not the message. The message works. But if you don't position yourself to be in the perfect will of God and you're in the permissive will of God, things won't work right for you. I'm trying to help you because I'm your pastor. Now, I'm going to share some stuff with you today that is going to be a little bit embarrassing for me. And that is going to be a little hard for me, but I'm going to do it because the Lord told me to do it. And the Lord said, you do it because it'll help the people. Uh, but what people do is that they, 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 they don't wait long enough. They rush, they jump, and, and, and they make mistakes. And then they wonder maybe this thing, this faith thing, this 
financial thing. Right. Whatever. Maybe this is a bunch of hogwash made up by some preacher. No, it actually really works. Yes, but you've got to be positioned for it to work. And the perfect and permissive will of God, where he talks a lot about that in his book, I would encourage you every year, read that book. In fact, uh, later, if you have it, Peter, just put it on the screen later on. You know, it's going to take you a while to find that cover. But just take a picture of the cover, Peter. Put it in a picture and put it up on the screen when you're ready. I want you to see what that book looks like. And I want you to order it. It's on Kindle. You can get it in our bookstore. But you, you need to read that once a year. He wrote that in 1987, give or take. Or it was about 1987. He probably wrote it afterward. But it's when Jesus appeared to him. I believe it was the last open vision he had of Jesus before he went home. And Jesus talked to him about my plans. Uh, people don't fulfill my plans. They fulfill their plans. Yes. And the church at large is missing a lot of my plans because they won't wait on me and they make decisions quickly and out of emotions. And so, and there's a lot of stuff in that book. Like for example, don't clap. Yes, Jesus talked to him and said, I'm displeased with my church. This is not a football game. Amen. They clap at the football game to cheer. He said, that's not what my word says. My word says lifting holy hands. Amen. Now, there's only one verse in the entire Bible that tells you to clap. And clapping is okay in certain situations. When you're in praise and worship, that's fine. But when God has done something like healed somebody, you don't ever clap. That grieves the Holy Ghost. Yes, that's right. I was in a service recently and people started to clap when somebody was here. I felt the anointing lift. Not here, another church. So, but all of that is in that book. See, it's a great book. You need to read that. But anyway, the point is, is that we need to take substantial at times, periods of time, despite our busy culture and wait on the Lord. That's really what I'm trying to get over to you. We know that this is a great year. We know that God has said a lot about this year and a lot about the future years. But what's the point if we don't walk in it? We may know something is great, but if you don't actually step into it and actually experience it practically for yourself in real time, then all it is is a bunch of words. So the key is not just knowing that there's something great on the horizon and that we've stepped into a certain timing in this church. The key is waiting on God in prayer and, and, and making sure that individually and corporately we are in the perfect will of God because if we are, we will experience all these promises he's told us. And if we're not, we will be limited in our experience of them. So it's not enough just to know that great things are coming. We've got to wait on God and find out that perfect will. The Lord said to me, pray things out and pray things out. Yes, sir. Meaning, really pray things in is what he's saying. Pray out the plan. You know, you're, you're laying the track. I want things to be prayed out because if you don't pray things out, you're not going to be able to walk in them. The spirit has to go first. The natural catches up. We all know that. That's a very common phrase. But then he paused and he said, that's not really only the only thing you do, son. He said, pray things out. And he emphasized the word out, meaning there's stuff in that should be out. There's things that are doing assignments, things attached to you that I don't want. And there was a person, a minister, uh, which, I, which I like, you know, they have a church, they're a good minister, but uh, I was starting to get closer to them and the Lord, uh, the, and I've been praying. I don't know what out means. So I'm praying things. I'm praying out a mystery. I don't know everything. But as I pray out that mystery, now God can get over to me. Certain things. Now, this minister is not part of our group with Pastor Nancy. It's another group. Good man, though. Lovely man. Has a great church. And even though he's not part of our fellowship, he's just a nice person. And I personally like him. But, uh, you know, and he's been talking to me about different things that they're doing and asking me to get involved. And so I haven't agreed, but I've been like, well... Let me check, because if you're not part of this flow, I really do check, because I don't want to get distracted. Yeah, yeah. So, but I was actually planning on doing something, planning on doing an event. And as I'm praying, remember he said, pray things out, but I don't know what, what has to leave. But I'm just praying in tongues. I'm just saying, Lord, whatever needs to go, I'm praying in the mystery. Now you've got to show me what needs to go, because I don't know what needs to go. But if you show me, I'll do it. And I'm standing before that person uh, just a few, couple months ago. I'm standing in December. I'm standing before that person, and they're, and, 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 I, and at that moment, I'm still kind of thinking, well, you know, maybe we'll get involved in this. Maybe we'll do that. And I heard the Holy Ghost speak a word to me as loud as I'm going to, I'm going to say it exactly how he said it and the tone he said it. I'm looking at them in their eye thinking, this sounds good. And I heard his voice, divorced, divorced, just like that. It shocked me. And I'm looking at him and in an instant, it felt like he was a stranger to me. It's like God removed any affection, any connection. It was gone in an instant. I heard the word divorced, meaning you're coming into some kind of a yeah. thing with this person. Yeah. And it's not that they're bad. Yes, no. 
because I know they're not bad, but what they're going to try to involve me in, even from a good heart, is going to pull me away from the plan of God that he has for me, even though it's good yes. and it's helping people. But just because it's helping people means nothing. Yes. Lots of people help people. The Red Cross helps people. But God said to me, divorced, meaning step back and never touch that again. Yes. And so I stepped back and I said, you know, brother, you know what? You know, I don't say, hey, God just told me to divorce you. I mean, you don't say things like that. So I just said, you know, brother, listen, I really appreciate all you're doing. And, you know, you've got a great thing. I said, but I'm just, I'm just in a flow here with Pastor Nancy. And I think it would take too much of my time. It would distract me. Oh, but no, no. I said, no, brother. And he's trying. And I'm just being gently. I'm just being passive aggressive. No, brother, that's fine. Because I'm not going to hurt his feelings. But I'm not going to get involved in something where God says divorced. See, I prayed that out. I, out. I prayed it out. Because if I got involved, because it seems good and it's helping people. You listening to me? I would have stepped in that area into the permissive will. And then what's going to happen, Jenny? It's going to start to grind. It's going to start to be hard. Six months from now, I'm going to go, I don't know what it is, Mary Chris, about that thing, but it just annoys me every time I think about doing an event. You should pay attention when that happens because it probably meant you got out of the perfect will of God because it's when it is the perfect will of God, you never feel that. There is a flow. There is a joy. There is a peace. It just moves like a water, like a current. There's a velvety feeling. That's what you're supposed to live like. Most people are living in the permissive will of God. They don't even know what the flow feels like. They're, always, they're just used to the grind. In fact, sinners even say it's a grind. Yeah, it's a grind because you're a heathen. But Christians should never live in a grind. But most Christians do. Because you're not in the perfect plan. You're in the permitted plan. Why? Because you jump without waiting. Well, whether it's helping you or not, it helped. It's helping me. Jesus said to Dad Hagen, uh, if people would know my plans more, I could do more in their lives. But you've got to know his plan. So last time I shared with you two weeks ago a lot about the international and about, you know, this boldness and about this Elijah thing and about, you know, this whole thing about the five years and being the, the, the hors d'oeuvre and then 27 years, it was more than all that put together. And now the full plate is coming and miracle. I mean, I shared all that. I don't want to share any of that again. I've already talked about all that. I want to talk about promise of life. That was international. This is now domestic. And I want to share something with you that I don't really want to share, but I'm going to share because I think it's important. Why is most of the correction coming right now about this church and not about my international ministry? Because my international ministry just started. It's infant. It's just developing. I haven't really made any mistakes. I haven't been around long enough to make too many mistakes because it's only started really this year. But this church been around a lot longer than a year and we sometimes make mistakes because things seem good and they feel good and then they get excited and especially if you have a heart to help people that can be a real negative because you want to help people God wants to help people but Jesus didn't help everybody at the pool of Bethesda he helped one man well what about the other men nothing is said about them the Holy Ghost is not that he doesn't love them but the assignment was for one sometimes you can't just help everybody you can't just do a food bank because there are hungry people in Mississauga. Is that God's perfect will for us? If it is, we'll do it and feed every person and every cat. But if it's not, we're not feeding no one. And it's not because there's not hungry people that need to be fed. It's God has to show us what is our assignment. And if we do it, it will flow. And if we don't, it will be hard. Have I primed them, Jesus? Have I primed them? Have I primed them? Okay. So, P, so sometimes uh, I have said things in the past, like I'm sensing this because I am sensing something. Or, you know, Lord, I'm planning on doing this. I may have said to some of you, I'm planning on doing this, doing that. You know, I have this position for you on the Ministry of Helps. Maybe I'm thinking about bringing you on staff. Maybe this, maybe that. I just want you to know, throw everything out. I said anything to you? I didn't say it. I deny, deny, deny. <laughs> everything is on the chopping block and everything is being reassessed because I got into a bad habit of having a lot of heart to help people and to want to change when I saw people struggling to want to try to help them in, in a lot of different varieties. And that doesn't mean it's the perfect will of God. I got involved in things that seem good, but that doesn't mean it's the perfect will of God. And because I failed in not truly waiting, because I'm telling you, in our fastest society, it's hard to wait. 
when you're sitting there and you're, you waited for a couple of hours, you're like, this is a long time. And God is looking at you and go, well, that was about three milliseconds in heaven. You know, days is a thousand years. So why don't you just wait a couple more hours? And then, and then, and then you get tired, you want to go and then you go eat and then you forget to wait. And then the pressure's on now, you have to make a decision. Well, I don't know, it feels good. Now, there is a measure you can follow that prompting. But on big things, you should not be doing it on it feels good. You should wait till you know. So everything's being reassessed. Can I tell you a story? Because uh, staff have been reassessed. Uh, different department, Ministry of Helps departments. I'm changing some, I'm canceling some, I'm, I'm making new ones because I have to reassess and make sure we're in the perfect will of God. And listen, on a church this size with this many departments and this many staff and this many things internationally and this many things with Pastor Nancy plus IPM for the Israel plus our native Indian, which we're starting to do, we're going to start to do stuff this year in the first. There's so many areas. It's going to take me weeks, if not months to go before the Lord and wait on him for every area to say, Lord, is this okay? And even then I'm trusting I'm not going to miss it. Yeah. But it takes time. So don't expect this is going to be next week because I'm, I'm going one thing at a time. And he's already reassessed a number of things and changed a number of things, but there's many more to go. It's going to be a process. But I have good news. I have good news. Really good news. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. And you better hurry up because it's 1134. You're not leaving till 134. So just, just get ready for it. Okay. Lock the doors, visitors. You cannot escape. Um, just kidding. Just kidding. That's how you don't get people to come back. Um, <laughs> First Kings chapter 18. Real quick here. I just want you to see something, please. First Kings 18, because I want you to know why this is happening. First Kings chapter 18. We are in, we're getting in the perfect will of God. I'm telling you we are. Now, have a look, please, in 1 Kings 18. This is Elijah. We're living in 1 Kings 18 now for the next number of years. It's certainly not the only scriptures we're looking at, but this is the prophetic kind of umbrella for this church for the next little while. This story, there's many symbols in the story, but I want you to see this now with me, please. And it says here in verse 30, 1 Kings 18:30. This after the, the prophets of Baal had done all their things and they cut themselves and the, their God didn't answer. And Elijah said unto all the people, come near to me. In other words, God wants you involved in this, not just me. And all the people came near to him. You need to come near to me in your hearts on this subject. And he, watch, repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Then, stop reading, look at me. There's another altar that he built from scratch. But he first repaired the altar of the Lord. There was an altar and it was broken. He fixed that altar and then he went and created a new altar, which is what the fire hit. Are you listening? And the Lord said to me, because uh, there's been a lot going on. And the Lord said to me last week, because I mean, it's, I'm working around the clock almost. There's so much I have to reassess. I'm going just constantly. I'm praying. I'm waiting on God and I'm trying to make, make sure we don't make more mistakes. And so I said, and the Lord said to me when I was in the shower a few days ago, I was praying and he said, son, did you notice there's a lot of organizing going on now? I said, yeah, Lord, there's a lot of organizing going on. He said, Does, didn't that's what Elijah did? Elijah is, what is he doing? The fire didn't fall yet. The water didn't get poured yet. What did he do before any of that happened? The water represents prayer. I preached it the 3rd of January. Listen to that sermon. Listen to it again. But that's, the prayer didn't even happen yet. What did he do? He took the old broken altar and he is putting in divine order. Yeah. He is reorganizing, fixing, repairing, making what's broken and out of order into right order. And then he goes and makes a new altar. Yeah. And the Lord said, there's a lot of organizing going on because you're doing what Elijah did in the first part of your Carmel year. You're putting things in divine order. Yeah. I thought, oh, well, that's, what, that's what's happening now. Yeah. And he said, but did you notice, go in chronological order. He didn't make the altar first. He repaired the existing altar. And I said, Lord, what does that mean? What does that symbolize? And he said, the altar that already exists, that is broken down, that is the plan of God that you are walking in right now. The altar that is new, he said, he went and structured and built a new altar. What is that? I said, Lord, what does that mean? He said, because when you fix things that are messed up in what you're already doing, then you're going to go and I'm going to help you structure your life, structure your schedule, make a whole new approach to living that is all around prayer. Yeah. 
But before you can start, and there's some overlap between the two, but before you can really start to change everything so that your life is revolved around prayer, because without prayer, we're not going to have a move of God. He said, fix the things you're already doing. So listen to me. Everything I've been doing has been repairing the altar of the Lord. I haven't even started building the new altar yet. Because what we are currently doing, the current altar, the current, you know, that altar represents the connection with God, but it represents symbolically the plan of God, what God is using in our lives right now. And it's some of it is broken. Some of it is out of order. And the current plan has to be tweaked, reassessed, and put back into the perfect will and get all the permissive or the out of will out. So he said, you are repairing my, because I was kind of feeling a little bit like, my God, everywhere I turn, you tell me I, I got to change this, change this, do that. Lord, it's exhausting. And he said, Elijah felt tired too. Because he's looking at a broken altar. I mean, physically, he had to grab those bricks. He had to move the junk away. He had to repair that thing that takes physical effort. And he said, it's a little bit tiring, but if you've got to do it because you don't have the right to build the next altar, if the current thing that you're walking in with me is off, yes, yes. not all of it is off, but some of it is off and you've got to repair what I've, what you're walking in presently with me. You've got to get it straight. Yes. I said, okay, Lord. And we are making a lot of, a lot of adjustments, but let me tell you a story. So this is good news. None of this is bad. This is good. So let me tell you a story. So I'm, I'm sitting there in early November, just after Jerry. Jerry came early November, yeah. just after I got back from Dominica. That's right. I was sitting here, I think it was, maybe it was even in the Jerry meetings, I really can't remember. And uh, I started to have uh, an uneasiness in here. It wasn't indigestion, because I thought maybe that was it. <laughs> it wasn't indigestion, it wasn't pizza. I didn't need gravel, you know, or Pepto Bismol. Indigestion, diet, okay. okay. I could do the commercial for you, but I won't. Heartburn, indigestion, upset stomach, diarrhea. Uh, Pepto-Bismol, it's very good, it works real great. But I thought maybe it's that, so I drank a whole bottle. And I would not suggest you do that because I had effects after drinking the whole bottle. But I thought, what is this uneasiness? This, this is obviously not heartburn, but I mean, I felt uneasy. And what I felt uneasy was something is wrong with the plane. So my first thought is, I'm going to die. That's what I thought. Something's wrong with the plane. I'm going to crash and die. Maybe I should get it repaired. Maybe I should get it fixed. So I started looking into that. But that, I had them check it. Everything's fine. I still have an uneasiness. The problem is that the next week, the uneasiness got worse. And the next week, the uneasiness got worse. And then when I was in Israel, the uneasiness was so bad, I actually felt physically sick. Every time I thought about it, I felt like I was going to vomit. And I said, my God, what is going on here? Lord, I don't understand what's going on here. The plane is fine. I'm safe. I'm following the plan. I'm doing my pilot's license. Everything is good. What is going on here? But something, it was like a churning, a churning in my stomach, in my spirit. My spirit is in my, in my stomach area, my belly area. And so I didn't know what was, and I'm just so, listen, when you don't know, remember Mr. Universe, Dennis Tenorino at the Marche at lunch with me, with everybody staring at him because he's a mountain of a man. He said to me, when you, know, he's in a, when you know nothing about nothing, pray in the Holy Ghost. So when you know nothing about nothing, pray in the Holy Ghost. So I just said, Lord, I don't know what's going on, but something is wrong and I don't know what it is. And I can't, I can't deny something is wrong. So I just started, and I started praying. I mean, hours and hours and hours, day after day after day. I'm praying, no answer, no answer, no answer. But the thing got worse. The thing got worse. So now we have Christmas, we have New Year's, we come into the Holy Ghost meetings, we go through the whole week of Holy Ghost meetings, and it's every time I think about it, I actually had to stop thinking about it. I said, Lord, don't, I'm not thinking about it because I, every time I think about it, I feel sick. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna think about it. And I'm praying, Lord, I'm praying the answer. You gotta show me what is, what is going on here. I don't understand what's wrong. But he didn't answer me. When he doesn't answer you, keep praying. Because he will answer you. And he not doesn't always answer you directly. Sometimes he answers you through other people. So I'm praying and it's, it's just there. And I, on the last Wednesday, it ended on a Wednesday night. 
On the last Wednesday, Wednesday morning, Stephen Dufresne preached. Wonderful message. You should all listen to it. Excellent message. Excellent message on healing. He's really developing as an excellent minister. And so he was preaching, and I'm sitting there, and I'm, and, and I'm at the lunch afterward. Pastor Nancy is turned. She's talking to Pastor Jean from Kenya. Uh, so she turned her chair. I'm opposite her, but she turned her chair. So she's not engaged in us. And there's all these ministers sitting at the table. Reba's sitting beside Jenny, and, you know, these other ministers there. And, and nobody, everyone's just kind of eating, and nobody's really dominating the conversation. And I don't know, it kind of got to a breaking point, and I didn't mean to say it. It actually came out of my mouth before I could stop it. It came out and I tried to grab it, but it was out already. Has that ever happened to you? And sometimes the Holy Ghost does that because he knows if he says, say something, you won't. Because you've just decided you're not saying it. It's not in his business, but yours. And I would have said no. So sometimes it would just pop out because he just almost overwhelms you and it comes out before you can stop it because he wants it to come out. And it came out of my mouth, not loud. Jay Eberly is sitting beside me. Jenny's on my left. And it just kind of came out of my mouth, just not very loud. I just said, what is wrong with that aviation department? And I said, it just, what is wrong with it? And, and then I, and I said, oh, my God. And I tried to, and then, I, and then I said, hey, brother, what's going on with it? And I tried to, but Pastor Jay's just too smart for his own good. And he looked at me and said, what did you say? I said, nothing. I didn't say anything. What did you say? Nothing. It's your ears. I don't know. Check your ears. I don't know. I didn't say anything. He said, you just said something. I heard the word aviation. I said, I don't want to talk about it. He said, Pastor. And then everybody stops and looks at me. Except Pastor Nancy, who's talking to Gene. Reba Rambo's looking at me. Everyone's looking at me. I said, I, leave me alone, Jay. I don't want nothing to say to you. And he said, tell me what you said. He started getting... I said, I don't know what it is. There's something wrong with my aviation department. I don't know what it is. I've, I've had a grieving since early November, and it's getting worse, and I can't take it anymore. I don't know what it is. I've prayed, I've prayed, I've prayed, I've prayed. I don't know what it is. I said, I just can't take it. I can't take much more of this. And he said, well, I can tell you what it is if you want me to. I felt like slapping him. <laughs> you haven't prayed. I've prayed. He said, I was praying for you all last week. And God spoke to me about your aviation department. Would you like to know? And I said, yes, sir. I would like to know because I'm desperate. I said, I would like to know. He said, it's very simple. You're not called to be a pilot. And if you don't quit this nonsense, it's going to distract you and hurt your ministry. He said it nicer than that, but that's what he said. No sin he stopped. Chris Cody, because everybody's listening, except Pastor Nancy. Chris, because she's talking to another pastor, her chair's turned around. Chris Cody says, Pastor Craig, can I say something? I said, oh God. He said, Dr. Hadabaugh and I were on the phone last week praying for you. And God spoke to us individually that you better stop this thing about the pilot. It's going to hurt your ministry. It's going to distract you. It's going to cause damage to you. And I went quiet. And then I see Ike. <laughs> Because Ike is very, very submissive. He's very sweet. And he's Pastor Jay's son. So he's very cautious, very honorable with what he says. And he says, can I say something? And I said, well, <laughs> I'm sure everybody at the table has a word for me. So why don't you go next, Jay, uh, to Ike? And he said, Pastor, when I came and preached at your church in July, my eyes were opened into the spirit. And he is a prophet and he sees stuff that other people don't see. That God, that, that gift of the discerning of spirits operates on him more than other people. And he said, my eyes were open in the spirit and I saw some things about your aviation department. And he said, I saw that you being a pilot is going to cause great damage to your ministry. It's going to distract you and it's going to hurt you. And I said, I looked at him and I said, why didn't you tell me? He said, that's not my place. I looked at Cody and I said, fool, why didn't you tell me? He said, that's not my place. I'm not over you. And you didn't ask me. Yeah. I looked at Pastor Jay and said, brother, we're brothers. Why didn't you tell me? He said, that's not my place. Well, great. I'm glad it's not everybody's place. But everybody seems to know more than me. As he says the words, it's not my place, Pastor Nancy turns her chair. And she's like, everyone's quiet, right? Because everyone's staring at me. There's silence on the table. You need Reba needed to start singing, you know. A perfect heart. I mean, we needed a perfect heart at that moment. And Pastor Nancy said, what y'all talking about? Nothing, Mom, nothing, nothing. What you talking about? I said, well, I just had a problem and these ministers are helping me. And Well, tell me what it's about. 
So I said, well, I said, there's just a problem with the aviation. And I said, these men, he said, and he, I told her what she said, they said. And I said, uh, I said uh, mom, you're, you're my authority. So what do you think? She goes, oh, I, I knew that long time ago. <laughs> and I looked at her. I said, you knew that long time ago? Oh, yeah, I've known that for a long time. Oh, yeah, it's going to hurt your ministry. It could cost you your life. And uh, it's, it's going to mess things up for you. I said, Mom, why didn't you tell me? You're my mom, why didn't you tell me? She said, because when you came to talk to me, you were so sure of yourself. Are you listening to me? Yes. And I'm playing back in my mind, because I'm sure she's wrong. So I'm playing back in my mind how that happened. And I remember the Lord brought it back to me. I remember I talked to her and I said, Mom, God spoke to me. I'm going to be a pilot. I'm getting a plane. I'm going to fly all over. I'm going to do it. I don't need no pilot. I'm an independent pilot. I don't need anybody. I'm going to just go whenever I want, not go whenever I want. What do you, isn't that awesome? I never once said, do you, what do you think? What's your spirit tell you? I just updated her. I preached to you not to do that, but I did it myself, not even realizing because I was so sure that this was God. She said, Pastor Craig, if you're that sure, it's not my place to talk you out of it because that could be considered manipulation. I said, from now on, please, if I'm sure, just tell me. She says, no, I'll never tell you unless you ask me. And when you ask me, you can't be sure when you ask me. You have to have an open heart or my words will fall on dry ground. So she, and then she just, everybody listened and she talked very gently to me. She was very kind and she just explained why. And she's, I'm telling you, it was a very precious moment for me. I wish not everybody was there, but that's how it happened. And she said, Pastor Craig, she said, you have a voice to the nations. She said, there, there's a call on your life that is far bigger than your local church. And she said, we need your ministry. And then Pastor Jay chimed up and he said, I've been praying. God's been saying the same thing, Pastor Nancy, that he has a very important role in the body of Christ as, at large. Yes. That's a pretty heavy statement to make. And she said, yes, he does. And she said, now, if you're going to be a pilot, you're going to, you, you know how much work it is. You've been training. You're 95% through. You know how much work and reach or current training you have to do? Flight plans, weather patterns, maintenance. She said, Craig, Pastor Craig, that is not your assignment. That is going to distract you. It's going to pull you away. And then when you're tired, now this is what, listen to me. She said, and then one day when you're tired, because you've just preached six hours over two days and you get in that plane and you're flying home by yourself and you're tired and you're trying to do your checklists, but you miss something. She said, you figure out the rest of the story. She said, it is not your assignment to fly that plane or any plane. Let somebody else who doesn't have your call do that. You, your job is to wait on God and preach. I mean, she cleaned my clock. But as I'm sitting there, this thing I felt for two months now, two months almost to the day, November to January, it just like it went, shoo. I felt like, a I felt like 10,000 pounds, pounds had gone. And I just, I felt so free. I felt so at peace, but I felt so foolish. I felt so dumb. You know how hard? I don't want to whine to you, but do you have any idea how hard I've trained? I'm 95% through my pilot's license. I've got two maneuvers to perfect, and then I do the final exam. I've got 10 hours worth of training left out of hundreds, well, not hundreds, but 150 hours I've done already. I'm the only pilot in the history of that school that took the training course, which is 211 lessons, and wrote a book about it. I wrote a book about the training course. You, I can show it to you. It's 110 pages, every line, single spaced, eight and a half by 11. I took every lesson and I wrote every, every major, I memorized it. I got 100% on my test of what was on that thing. I mean, the guy said, he said, he said, there's something wrong with you. He said, I've never seen anybody take this so seriously. You wrote a book about the course? The course is already a book. Just study the book. Why did you write another book? I said, because that's how I memorize. I have to write. I have to type. I have to go over. I mean, I worked harder than any student, he said, I've ever seen in this course school over years. He said, you are one of the most diligent students I've ever seen. And I said, I'm doing that because my wife is in the plane with me. My children are in the plane with me. It can't be theory to me. I have to know it. I have to know it. 
and how many hours I put landing that thing and taking and going in bad weather and learning emergency procedures and learning the radio and talking on the radio. And I'm telling you, I have worked my tail off and I've got less than 10 hours to go. And this thing happened. And I said, Lord, why don't you let me finish it and then do this? Because at least I've accomplished something. I can say I finished it. I don't like quitting. I don't like quitting halfway through. I hate that. I got to finish what I start. That's the way my mother raised me. Finish what you start. And I said, Lord, why couldn't you tell me this later? He said, because you've never been in my perfect will. And I'm trying to get it over to you that you're out of my perfect will. And I want you to stop. I don't, God don't care about finishing it. He cares about his perfect will. And then he's, I'm teaching you some lessons, whether you're listening or not. Learn from my mistakes. And then he said, do you remember Randy came up with the plane, the new plane, his plane? And he said, I've never seen the devil attack something in my life like this. That's what he told me. And the shaft on that thing broke and they had to fly it back to Tulsa. That's why he couldn't bring it up the first time. We couldn't dedicate it the first time. That has never happened in the history of this company over 50 years. Never, ever has that broken. And he said to me, he said, I know there's a devil involved here, but he didn't realize what was going on. He knew the devil was attacking. Yeah. And, but he thought it was because this is just a frontal assault. Yeah. But after this happened, the Lord spoke to me and he said, the reason the devil, the devil was attacking. He said, the reason the devil attacked is because you cracked the door. Yeah. When you get out of the perfect will and into the permissive will, the door is cracked. It's not open. When you get out of the will altogether, you open the door. Then anything can happen to you. But when you're in the permit, what God permits, but it's not really what he authored, you crack the door just a little bit. But devils, will, just like cockroaches, they'll come in through that little opening. And he said, that's why we, I almost died in the training. That angel, my wife got up that morning. God said, there's something going to happen. Put that angel, put that blood. And I'm telling you, that, that engine died twice as we were landing on my trainer plane. And the guy told me, he said, if you had gone out over Lake Erie, which was the plan... And we just did one quick circle just to make sure everything was good, which we don't normally do. Wow. We just go. But he said, I just feel we need to do a circle. Thank God he did that because it died twice in the circle. And we glided in. Yeah. That's dangerous. <laughs> okay. And then now they checked the thing. And they said, no, this thing's busted. It's broken. If you had gone out over the lake without doing that circle, he said, this would have died over the lake. Yeah. This is in February with frozen water. He said, you, the guy, he went white, the, the mechanic, he went white. He said, you would have gone into that lake. Oh my God. Yeah. And I didn't even know the emergency procedures at that time in my training. I wouldn't even have been able to call on the right channel to say, mayday, 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 going down. I didn't even know what the channel was. Do you understand how serious that is? I would have had to call them back in the, in the, you know, in the, in the place where my, where the FBO is. But sometimes that guy's out doing errands. They're not always by the desk. I would have said, mayday, mayday, mayday. No, there was a good chance nobody would have heard me. I would have gone into that lake at what? Two degrees, three degrees. You get hypothermia in less than four minutes. And how are you going to swim in that? But you, you have no idea how close I came to dying that day. And it's because she, God, now this is, in his permissive will, he will still protect you and help you as much as he can. But because you cracked the door, devils come. I didn't know I'd cracked the door. But that's why those things happen. Because you're outside that place. Thank God God preserved. Because God will work with you in the permissive will as much as he can. That crack broke. That's never happened. That's those devils that are affecting because there was a cracked door. And I didn't know it. Because I was so, I had prayed. I felt it good. I felt peace. On, but you know what? I'm learning that on big decisions, yes, when you drive on which highway to take, just go with that peace. Mm -hmm. But when you're making a decision to become a pilot that could kill you, maybe you should go on more than just, I just feels good. Yes, maybe you should wait and pray until you know that you know that you know that you know. Yes. And then when you're sure that you know, Cancel all of that. Go to your spiritual parent and say, I'm not sure. Yes, Even though you are. What is your counsel? Because they may know something that you don't. Yes, and I didn't do that. That was my failure. If I'd done that, she would have told me. And don't judge Pastor Nancy. She's not to blame. She don't talk unless you ask. Because there's a divine order. It violates divine order for a parent, in this case, to dictate without the open door. Do you understand? 
So I just want you to know that's a very valuable lesson that I have learned, and so I'm not being a pilot. Some of you that are looking for a new pastor would like me to be a pilot so that you can get another pastor because I'll go to heaven early. And part of me thought maybe it would be better to go to heaven early because I'd rather go to heaven than be here. The heaven is glorious. This is not. But this is not that. No, this is my assignment. This is my plan. People like it. People don't like it. I really could care less. Did I waste a lot of time? Absolutely. The permissive will of God always wastes time. Did I spend a lot of money that, I, that it was a waste? Absolutely. The permissive will of God always costs you money. <laughs> did I burden myself unnecessarily? You bet I did, because the permissive will of God is a burden to you. It's not light and easy. Woo! But I'd rather humble myself before you and before God, before the ministers at that table and before my mother and say, I missed it then get in that plane and die. And when I told, I went, flew down to see Randy Greer about a couple situations, the plane being one. Just on Thursday, I was with him. He said, come with me, Pastor Craig. He said, we're going to solve all the world's problems. And I said, well, it's going to take more than two hours to do that. And we drove together just real slow on this country road in Florida. And I just talked to him for two hours and he talked back to me. And when I explained all this to him, because he's helped us from the beginning, and I needed his agreement, I needed his approval. I felt like I'd let him down. And he looked at me, he pulled over, he sparked, and he looked at me, he said, now look at me. <laughs> he said, I tried to warn you, do you remember? I said, I know, don't even talk about it. He said, do you remember I sat you down in my office, I read you that scripture? Do you remember I warned you? I said, I think you're too busy. I don't know if a pilot thing is the right thing for you. And you said, but I, but I know, but I know, but I know. He said, do you remember that? I said, I know, I remember that. He said, I was trying to get over to you, son, that I just don't think this is right for you. But you want it so bad. So I didn't want to dissuade you. So I said, okay. But I told you. I said, I know, brother, I missed it. I just missed it. I just, I just missed it. I'm sorry. I, I didn't, I just missed it. And I never even wanted to be a pilot anyway, but I just felt that that was what God wanted me to do. I felt that was the plan. I just felt it was part of the plan. And he looked at me and he said, if you're in the permissive will, which obviously you are, that's why all this stuff was happening. He said, I just thought the devil was attacking you. He said, now I see the devil was attacking you because you allowed him to attack you. He said, if, he looks at me, he's right now. He said, if you fly a plane in the permissive will of God, you will get killed. He said it right to my face. He said, you, he said, I cannot allow you as an overseer in your life. I can't make you but I'm giving you counsel because I was asking for his counsel. I already knew because of the thing in California, but I just wanted to include him because he, it's honorable to include him. And he said, I'm warning you, if you're in the permissive will, you don't ever fly a plane on your own because he said, it's only a matter of time, you will be killed. The devil will kill you. He said, he's got that crack and he will exploit that crack. And he said, just like Pastor Nancy said, there'll come a day where you're so tired, you're not thinking straight. You make decisions, bad decisions. And all of a sudden, one bad decision can kill you. So he said, I'm proud of you for humbling yourself. He said, I'm 100% in agreement. Tell your congregation, I'm 100% in agreement. You should not be the pilot of this plane. And I'm glad. I said, but I wasted so much time. And Pastor Nancy said to me, you, yes, you did. But Pastor Craig, she said, listen, you got a great education. You know now a lot about planes. He, she said, if there ever was an emergency, you could help. If you, if, you know, if you're keeping the plane or another plane in the future and you got another pilot you're paying, you at least know some stuff they should be doing so they can't cut corners with you. She said, it's never a waste to learn from one perspective. But she said from another perspective, yeah, you know, you missed it here. So I just want you to know, Randy Greer's in agreement. My spiritual parents are in agreement. And I just, I just, I, I, I don't like missing it. But what, what, what happened was I got that spirit of intercession came on me years ago to pray out for aviation. And I said, Mom, I prayed. I had the anointing. I groaned. I'm, I'm telling you. I, I knew it. I birthed it. I birthed it. I know I did. I groaned for 45 minutes. You can't make somebody do that. I said, how do you explain that? She said, oh, that's easy to explain. I said, well, well then tell me. She said, when God is giving you an assignment, it's always in seed form. She said, what you did is you birthed out that thing 
and you thought God put a tree in your heart. And then the, and two days later, after that happened, I bought the hanger. And she said, you picked the fruit. You harvested your crop. But she said, God doesn't put a tree inside you. God puts a seed inside you. And she said, seeds take time to grow. She said, birthing out is fine, but it's a seed. It's not for now. The seed may grow faster than other seeds, but it takes time for that seed to come and for that plan to be revealed and for the timing of it and for the perfect will of God to come. She said, it can take years. But she said, as soon as this, you prayed that out, you, you thought it was the fruit to, to reap the harvest. You bought the plane 24 hours, the, 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 the thing 48 hours later. Do you understand how I missed it there? She said, you thought it was a tree, but it was a seed. God puts something in you for aviation, and there is something for your ministry for aviation, but it's probably not now. It's probably something that is in you, and it's going to grow over time, and at the right time, he'll say, now. But you said now as soon as it was planted, thinking it was a tree instead of a seed. I said, but hold on, hold on, hold on. That angel helped me get that hanger. How do you explain that? How do you explain that? If it's out of God's will, why did the angel help me get the hanger if it was out of the timing? Because angels work to a measure in the permissible of God, but not fully. They will help you as far as they can, but they, in the perfect, they help you 100%. In the permissive, they'll help you as much as possible. So yes, that, we did get favor. That angel did help because it's still permitted by God, but it's not fully blessed by God. Are you with me? So I'm trying to understand how did all this work? How did all this happen? How can I, if I missed it, why did God seem to bless me? Well, he'll bless you as far as he can. Dad Hagen said in that book, he'll bless you as far as he can in the permitted will, but it's never full. Okay, and I have to close, but I've got to at least give you principle number one because I'm teaching principles about the scenario that changed, that's changing my life. Yes. I'm only going to get to one, but I'll do the rest later, and I'll go real quick. It's 12.04. Just give me a couple more minutes. Principle number one is picking up the lack of joy and peace and not just the sick feeling and dread. What do I mean by that? Listen, this is what he said to me because this really rocked my world. Do you understand? I went, came home from that Holy Ghost meeting as I was seeking God. Like, I'm like, Lord, how did I miss this? What? And so he's teaching me. That's how the angels work because they work in the permissive will, but not fully. So you'd birth it out. It's a seed form. It's not a tree form. Just because intercession comes on you doesn't mean you start doing it right away. So I'm learning these things. But I come home and I said, Lord, why did this only happen in November? I've been training for over a year. I could have saved all that time. In other words, what I was saying, not accusatory, why didn't you talk to me earlier? That's really what I was saying. I'm just being polite, but that's really what I'm saying. Why didn't you talk to me earlier? And the Lord said something to me I want to I wanna help you with because it really helped me. He said, son, when I, when I give you an assignment, there's always a grace for that assignment. In this case, the, the pilot's thing. He said, if those graces or anointings, they have joy and peace, velvety feelings attached to them. Now listen to me. He said, if, the, if it's the perfect will of God, perfect will includes the timing. If it's the perfect will of God, those graces will come on you usually before you start the assignment. You can feel that grace come on you even though you haven't even started it yet. He said, but other times as you step out in faith, the grace comes as you do it. That's as it starts. Now listen to me. I'm teaching you something that cost me a lot to teach. This is a precious price I've paid to learn this. And most people don't talk about this. They know, but they don't always teach on it. He said to me, now this is, I don't like to give an exact day, but that's how he said it to me. He said, if in a short period of time, I said, what does short mean? He said, 30 days. If in a short period of time, after you start an assignment, check your spirit for the grace, for the peace, for the joy, for the anticipation, for the velvety feeling, for that, hmm, this is, this is good. Check. Because if it hasn't come on you, shortly after starting, you're out of my perfect will. And it's easy, my brother and sister, to miss the perfect will. Believe me, I've done it. It's easy. And not just in this, in many areas. It's easy. You can miss it easy. 
Fear can make you miss it. Pressure from people can make you miss it. Financial things can make you miss it. Emotions, excitement, joy of your soul, not of your spirit, can make you miss it. A lot of things can get you out of that perfect will. He said to me, if in a short period you do not feel that grace on you, that anointing, that joy and peace, after you've started, he said, go back and check. And this is, so he really answered me. What he was saying to me was, listen to me. He said, if you had checked your spirit when you started training, you would have realized there was no grace. And I said, Lord, explain that to me. And he, I'm telling you, he's a, he's a counselor. He'll he count, I mean, he's like a psychiatrist. Oh, yeah, he's better. Capital P. And he said to me, do you remember when you'd call your wife on the way from the Hampton Inn to the airport in Jamestown? I said, yeah, I called her every time I went to train just to say hi. And he said, do you remember what you'd say to her? And I kind of didn't. And he had to remind me. He said, do you remember you'd say, I, I, I just, I hate doing this. I hate doing this. Every single time. And she'd say, honey, it's okay. Just, you know, just keep going. Don't quit. And I'd say, I hate doing this. I have no, I just... I know it's the plan of God, but I just, it doesn't feel, doesn't feel good to me. And I'd get up and I'd fly. The next day, I'd feel that, not dread, just, and I thought it was my emotions. I thought it's because I don't want to learn. You know, you're up in that little plane and that wind starts going and the whole thing is shaking. It can be a bit scary. So I thought, I'm just being a wimp. I, I, and then I would tell myself, tough it up, Craig, be a man. And I'd quote scriptures to myself, quit ye like men, Paul said. <laughs> now I'd quote that to me, quit ye like men. Stop being a wimp. Get out of your emotions. Right. This is the plan of God. Go and do it. Yeah. I know you don't want to study, but sit down and study that book and write that book on the book. <laughs> do it. No, I pulled myself up. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'm saluting myself in the mirror. Yes, sir. Yeah. But <laughs> no dread, right. no sick feeling, but... I didn't slow down long enough because I was so sure to see, is this, is there a grace on me for this? Because if I had, of, I would have learned very quickly, uh, there isn't. And then I would have gone to reassess and I would have said, hold on a second. If this is, is this assignment from God, if this is a perfect will of God, I should have a grace for it. There should be a joy and a peace. I should be excited about going to that airport. Why do I always feel like it's a drag? I'm in the permissive will of God and I don't realize it. I'm trying to help you because there's situations in your life you need to apply these yeah. principles to. May not be piloting for you, but it might be marrying somebody. It might be the job you're in. It might be the house you're going to buy. You better pay attention. These are principles that can help you. Then the Lord said to me, I'm almost done. He said, there's a curve, son. And I saw this thing, this curve, like an like a, like a S-shaped curve, kind of going up like that. And he said, at the end of that, you know, you know, you can see like a chart. At the end of that line, he said, the season of mercy ends. Yeah. Wow. And then I saw a dotted line past the curve. It went like an S and then a dotted after that line. And I said, what is that? Because I'm seeing it in the spirit. And he said, that's out of the will of God. He said, if you get to the dotted line, that's how the devil kills you. He said, now, listen to me. I'm helping you, whether you realize it or not. He said, spiritual people of which you're not. That's what he said to me. He was mad at me. You're not. You're carnal in this area. Spiritual people check at the beginning of the assignment. And then they reassess and they get out of it to get back in the perfect world. But you didn't do that. You had to be tough. You had to be macho. You had to push through. So he said, you went with no peace, no peace, no peace. And it starts to escalate. Now what's happening is the peace, the lack of peace starts to intensify intensify. He said, but you didn't notice it till you were halfway up that curve. Yeah. Now he said, watch what happens. He taught me this. He said, when you get up to the upper part of that S curve, yeah. upper part, he said, I intensify the feeling to the point that you feel sick. Yeah. If you're spiritual and if you have a prayer life, if you don't have a prayer life, you won't even get what I'm talking about because you won't even feel that. Yeah. But I'm talking to people that have a prayer life. Yeah. Because that's the only way he can lead you is by your spirit. If you have a prayer life, you'll be sensitive. If you don't have a prayer life, you won't even pick up what I'm talking about. Then you're really finished. He said, when you get to that top portion, I intensify it to save you. I make you feel total, not just a lack of peace, total dread, total sick feeling. Because I'm trying to shake you and say, 
Pay attention. Something is wrong. You're in the upper echelons of my permissive will. And if you cross that line, you step into the out of my will, and then the devil's got full access to you. Now listen to me. He said, if you violated, he told me after the fact, if you had violated that sick feeling and you had pushed through, I'm going to get this license. I'm going to finish what I started because I was trained that way. I'm going to do it because it's the right thing to not waste money. I'm going to finish it. He said, if you had pushed through, the devil would have an open door. He would have tried to kill you in that plane. He said, it was good that you paused and you waited on me and you stopped all training. Because when you, but he said, son, you did it up here. Doesn't take much spirituality to figure that out. He said, you should have done it down here. You shouldn't wait for a sick feeling. There should be enough to say, I don't know if there's a grace on me, if there's an anointing on me. Because if there was, I would have joy. Why every time do I drive to the airport and I don't feel joy? See, such a small thing. And you can talk yourself out of it to say, come on, be tough. You're just lazy. Come on, not not everything's about prayer. Just do your job. Do the lesson. Come on. You see, that's what I was saying. You see, and it sounds noble, doesn't it? Like I'm a good work ethic. Like I'm really being disciplined. But don't ever be disciplined in violation of your spirit. Because my spirit had no peace. My wife didn't pick it up. I didn't pick it up. I'm just focused on what I think is the plan. Because I interceded and birthed it. But I didn't realize it was a seed. Not a tree. It's not for now. It's for later. Are you you hearing what I'm saying? If check your when you're doing things, is there peace? Is there joy? If there's that grinding, that uh, something's hard, something's, I don't know what it is. It just feels like gravel road instead of paved road. Something, I don't know what it is, but something just doesn't feel right. I don't, I don't have that excitement, that joy. Then stop. And go back to God and say, Lord, is this job right? He might say, no, you did it because I offered you more money. You missed it. Well, now what do I do? I've already left my other job. Stay in the job, wait on me, and start looking again. I'll give you the right one. But don't keep going on that job when there is a sense of, now listen, I'm not talking about laziness. You may not like your job because you don't like your job, because you don't like your boss, because you don't like what you're doing. And that's lazy. That's emotional. But but in here, there's peace. Follow the peace. But if you're doing what you're doing and there's no peace, even if you love what you're doing, there's no peace. Please pay attention when there's no peace, because it shows that you have stepped out of God's perfect into what God is permitting, but he's not really fully behind it. And he'll work and protect you as far as he can, but not fully. Angels will work, favor will work, but not fully. And there'll always be something not quite right. But if you keep going, look how kind he is. You keep going, it just get worse. That's why I say praying in tongues is a great equalizer. It don't matter where you miss it, just keep going. Just keep going. It'll get worse. It'll get worse. It'll get worse because you're going up that S curve. And when you get to the point of something is wrong, I don't know what it is, you better stop what you're doing. You better, st- you better pause that relationship before you get married. You better stop. Stop. Because if you violate that, you'll cross that border of the mercy, of the mercy season. You'll get into the dotted line. Now you have totally violated, now you've not only violated the perfect will, you've violated the permissive will. Now you're in the out of will category. And when you're doing that and you're proceeding despite a dread in your spirit, you are an open target for the devil to hurt you, hurt your, that's, that's how people get in accidents. I'm not saying that's the only reason. Don't, don't think that if you've got an accident that that's you. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that's how these things happen in people's life. They get cancer. They get problems. Things don't work out. They wonder, this faith message don't work. It's got nothing to do with the faith message. It's because you are out of the will of God. And the devil has access, no matter how much you apply the blood, that precious blood which has power, but when you're out of the will of God, it cannot work for you the same way. You understand? You can notify angels. You can release your faith. You can command in the name of Jesus. It will not work for you the same way because everything has to be in the right position for it to work for you. So I learned a very valuable lesson about this first principle. Follow the peace. 
not just the dread. Follow the uneasiness. Don't wait for it to be sick. Go on the lower part of the curve. Don't wait till you get to the upper and don't ever continue when you feel dread because you'll pass that boundary and that's where major, major problems happen. God can protect you still in the permissive will to a measure, but he can't, he can't. He has to take his hand off you when you get in the out of the, out of the will of God. Are you listening to me? This is one of six principles. I sat with God for almost a whole day and I said, Lord, I'm embarrassed, I'm ashamed, I'm, I feel like I've let you down, my wife down, my church down, my spiritual parents down, these ministers all think I'm an idiot now. And he said, no son, they don't think that. And actually a lot of them came back and said, your humility in this really helped me. Pastor Jake texted me and he said, I'm so, I'm so impressed, he said, because it takes a spiritual man to recognize they've made a mistake, to humble themselves, and to not care what anybody thinks because you want the will of God more than you want people's approval. And he said, I applaud you. He said, you did the right thing. He said, this is an example to all of us. Amen. And Pastor Nancy's never judged me a day in her life. She's not like that. Neither is Reverend Greer. So, and I, I, if you do or don't, that's your business, but I, I hope you understand my heart. I'm not trying to make bad decisions. I'm just saying I fell into something all of us can fall into it. I hope that if you have, you'll get out. And this first principle is so critical, so critical, so critical, so critical. When I went to Haiti, remember, who was with me? Were you with me? Remember when we went there? See, I didn't know that back then. I just knew something was wrong. Then on the roof, we got sick and all the stuff. And God said, you're out of my perfect will. Uh, but, but you see, I remember when we crossed that border. I thought, something doesn't feel too good. But I, that's okay. We're, the, we're got authority. We got rights. I got tiger rights. You see, you can take all the sermons and misquote them. But something inside didn't feel too good. See, what I had done is the peace had departed, but I didn't have a dread because I was on the lower end of the S curve. But now I'm in the permissive will of God. That's how that sickness, that's how all that stuff, nothing happened in Dominican Republic, but it all happened in Haiti. Why? Because as the leader, I got out of the perfect will of God. Do you understand? That's why when I go to these countries and it's dangerous, I have to know that I'm in the perfect, perfect perfect will of God because when I am I am completely safe but if I'm if there's an uneasiness before I'm making the plans I better listen to that I better listen to that in fact there's one trip that I'm planning because I was invited to another country and and I thought well that, that looks good I have a hole in the calendar I, I was gonna do it so I was texting the guy to say I'm open to do that pastor's conference if you want but inside there was something that just didn't feel right and I was pushing through it I want to help people. Yeah. And I heard the Holy Ghost say, haven't I just taught you with the plane? Mm -hmm. Haven't I just taught you this? What? <laughs> Hun, buddy, you're in the bottom of the S curve. Don't wait till you get to the top. You feel, you feel that? Something doesn't feel right. I said, yeah, I feel that, Lord. He said, don't go to that country. So I called an appointment with the pastor to be respectful and I'm going to meet with them in a couple of weeks and I'm going to say, I can't go to that country. I'm sorry. I know there's a great opportunity and there's a lot of people there. Man, there's a big hundred thousands of people. I mean, it could really put me on the map. I don't care about the map. I care about the will of God and I'm going to say, I can't go. Maybe God let me go next year. Maybe God let me go the year after, but I can't go this year. Something doesn't feel right. But when I think about India, perfect, perfect peace. When I think about Liberia, perfect peace. When I think about Israel, perfect peace. But when I think about some of the other places, there's no perfect peace. So that's the permissible. You go to the permissible, they can put you in prison. I'm trying to help you understand. Don't, don't marry somebody. That's why you date a couple times. You're not dating to see how cute they are and how good they kiss. You're dating to check your spirit, buddy. You better follow that. If there's a lack of peace, you better watch it. Well, I, how do I do it with my job? Because if I take the job, I've got the job. You can know in your spirit before you take the job if there's a peace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you don't have a prayer life in tongues and a worship life with yeah. God, you will not even pick up whether there is a peace or not. Why? Because you're mental dominated. You're feeling dominated. You're emotional dominated. And everything is how you feel, but what you need to do is look here. That's why the more you pray in tongues and the more you worship, the more you get in the Word, you'll develop the spirit man to the point where you'll pick up, oh, that's, there's no peace there. Ah, I'm on the bottom of the S-curve. Get out quick, get out fast. Yeah. Good. And if you keep missing it, 
It'll get worse and worse. Pay attention. Get out faster and get out quicker. Don't ever keep going. That's how you end the problems. That's one of six principles. I hope you come back next week for the other five. Father, in Jesus' name, I bless you and I thank you. Lord, yes, we make mistakes, but we'd rather get back into the perfect will of God than have damage done. I thank you for those ministers that picked it up even though I didn't. I thank you, Lord, for this whole scenario, even though it's, un, it's unnecessary, it's disappointing. But, Father, it's, it's a good learning lesson for me for my long-term future and for this precious congregation. You want us in the perfect will of God, and we get there by waiting and having an extended prayer life so that we don't make mistakes, so that things work for us, so that this message of faith actually produces fruit for us. We give you praise and glory for it in Jesus' name. Just put that in Jesus' name. We thank you and we praise you. Very quickly, because I want to end the service. It's already late. So I'm going to do this very fast. Either you know you need God or you don't. Don't waste my time. Just be honest with yourself. If you need Jesus to save you today, and there is somebody in this room that needs it because the Lord spoke to me, don't, be, don't, don't play games. Just put your hand up right now so I can pray for you. Either you know it or you don't. But there's somebody here that needs to receive Jesus. You've heard what I've said and you know that God's not real to you and you need him to come in and be your savior and you need to make your life right with him. Who is that person? Who is that person? I'll give you one more minute. Either you do it or you don't. Who's that person? Well, Father, I thank you, whoever they are, you touch them, you help them, you bless them as far as you can. Lord, if they want to come up and talk to the ministers at the front afterward, they're more than welcome to do that. Don't let them leave this property without making things right with you. Their life is like a vapor, you said in your word. They come here one day and gone the next. We don't know what tomorrow holds. And Father, if they're not in the right relationship with you, they're probably not in your perfect will. That's a dangerous place to be. We want to get born again. We want Jesus to be in our hearts. We want the Holy Ghost to be our guide so that we can make sure that our life is in the right will and the right path. Because that is where the safety is and that is where the long life is. So, Lord, touch them. Don't let them leave this place, Father. Just convict them for them to come and talk to somebody at the front before they go. Father, I bless this congregation. Lord, I know it's a bit maybe heavier than normal today, but it's a, it's a teaching and it's a learning. And, Lord, I pray that they would have ears to hear what the Spirit of God and what the Word of God wants to show. And I've got scriptures for all this, which I will read them next week because I ran out of time today. So we bless them, help them have a wonderful week. We'll come back on Wednesday and be ready for the word again. In Jesus' precious name, everybody said amen. Amen. Praise God. We're going to take up uh, our second offering. If you ushers are in the aisle to serve you an offering envelope. Uh, Where's my paper? Uh, I don't even know what a second offering is for. Where is it? That's okay. Why don't you just make something up? Radio. Praise God. Well, we're doing healing broadcasts every week. Four more people emailed in last week for healing. I called them all out on the radio. I felt that anointing go. I believe that God is healing and touching them. And so we're doing that every week, Healing Fridays. Tell, if you know somebody that's sick, you know, if you don't have time to witness to them, just say, listen to Joy 1250 at noon on Friday. You'll get your healing. You be my advertisers for this as well, okay? And uh, if you need healing in this congregation, you don't need to wait for the radio. You can just come and talk to Andrew at the back and say, could Pastor pray for me? I, I need healing. I'm in your church. You have access to me. The radio people don't. So if you need healing, don't, you don't have to email the request. Just come and see me after service. I'll be happy to pray for you. We're going to take an offering today just to help that extra time that we're doing and the expenses of the radio. Father, bless the givers now as they prepare that offering. Thank you, Lord, that we're on a quest. We're on a journey and we're all learning and we all make mistakes and there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Father, we have, are on a journey to walk after the Spirit, to maintain the perfect will of God in our lives, and to follow that peace on the inside of us. And if there's a red light, we'll follow that too, in Jesus' name. And Lord, I thank you that the people learned something from this experience, and that I'm going to live long and strong because I'm in the perfect will of God. 
I give you glory and I give you praise. Bless the offering now. Bless the people on the radio that listen. Thank you for more healings every week. Thank you for a mighty healing river, a force that goes out over the airwaves every Friday and that people are delivered and demons come out and people are healed of mental torment and of every type of physical malady. We thank you for a mighty wave of healing that is going out over the radio airwaves every Friday. We sow now financially into that and we thank you, Lord, it will bring back a harvest to our lives. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Pass those buckets, praise God. There's ministers here at the front to pray for you. If you'd like the prayer of agreement, anything like that, praise the Lord, we're here to help you and to bless you. So, uh, we have a wonderful service Wednesday planned. I'm continuing my series. We're gonna have a great time being led by the Spirit. I love you all, be blessed. The cafe is open. Don't be sad now. Some of you are sad. Are they sad because I'm, I'm not a pilot? Or are they sad because I'm going to live long? Or I don't know what they're sad about. Don't be sad. Stand up, greet somebody, and uh, make sure you walk in love today. And we'll see you Wednesday. We'll see you Tuesday for prayer. Be blessed.